Amadeus in Retrospect, The Music, Life, and Legacy of Wolfgang Amade Mozart. Good afternoon. I'm Vincent Deloise. I'm the Cultural Ambassador of the Waterbury Symphony Orchestra, President of the Connecticut Summer Opera Foundation, and an Assistant Clinical Professor of Ophthalmology at Yale University School of Medicine. The Music, Life, and Legacy of Wolfgang Amade Mozart continue to fascinate and enthrall us. Mozart has been the subject of more books, articles, and commentary than any other composer in the Western canon. Mozart brought classical style to its apotheosis, creating masterpieces in every genre, sonata, concerto, symphony, opera, chamber music, leader, and choral and sacred works. Several of his last works presage Romanticism. It has been said that to discover the real Mozart, one needs simply to listen to his music. But what about Mozart the man? Can we learn anything about his genius from a review of his life? That's the function of this talk. Mozart's life, for some people, is an unfinished narrative. He died before his 36th birthday. But I say that we should rejoice because he left us 600 or so works many of which are masterpieces in their genre. Let's begin by listening to Mozart. Here's a beautiful example of his music, the Andantino movement of the Flute and Harp Concerto in C major, Kirkel 299. Mozart was born in Salzburg on January 27, 1756. He died in Vienna on the 5th of December, 1791. He composed over 800 works, 626 of which are in the Kirkel catalog, the catalog of his works, and 200 or so are in the appendix of that catalog, the Kirkel Anhang. 54 symphonies and sinfonias, 40 concerti for piano, violin, clarinet, bassoon, oboe, flute, French horn, 22 operas, 20 masses including the Great Requiem, which we'll be hearing this afternoon, and hundreds of chamber music compositions and Lieder, the German art song. What's in a name? People call him Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, but is that a name that he called himself? Actually, if we look at the baptismal certificate, it gives us the answer. The certificate reads Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theophilus Mozart. We don't see the word Amadeus anywhere in that certificate. Theophilus is Greek for loving of God or God-loving, which would be Amadeus in Latin or Gottlieb in German. But Mozart only used the French form, Amade, or the Italian form, Amadeo, or just the abbreviation W.A. He never used Amadeus himself. The only two times we find it in his writing is when he was joking in Latin and in jest. The wedding certificate of Mozart and his uh, wife, Constanze Weber, 
does show his name in Latin. That was written by the administrator who wrote the certificate. But other than that, we don't find Amadeus anywhere in Mozart's writing. Here we have examples of his French form, which he liked the best, the Wolfgang Amadei Mozart, or the Italian form, Wolfgang Amadeo Mozart, or the abbreviation simply W.A. Mozart. Mozart began composing at the age of five. He was a prodigy on the harpsichord and then pianoforte, a virtuoso violinist and violist. He had absolute pitch, which we call perfect pitch, and an eidetic memory, a photographic memory for musical scores. Of the hundreds of portraits of Mozart that are out there, only about 10 or 11 are considered authentic and painted during his life. This famous one at the age of six, we're not even sure if it is Mozart, and we're not even sure if the painter, the artist, is Lorenzoni, but that's what's usually stated uh, in the books that you read on the composer. His father, Leopold, knew that he had two prodigy children in music, his son Wolfgang, and Wolfgang's older sister, Mariana, whose nickname was Nanero. He traveled many times with, this, with, the stu uh, with his children uh, around Europe, uh, as we shall see. Uh, and in these uh, trips and tours, the, uh, the children were able to show off their skills on piano uh, to the delight of audiences around Europe, including royalty uh, in uh, Vienna and Paris and London. The first tour that Mozart did, Wolfgang did, was in 1762, so he was about six years old, and that was a tour to Munich, Paris, London, and Italy. And there were multiple illnesses along the way. The, the, the children got smallpox uh, and also a typhus, uh, uh, which was a, another kind of microbial disease. Their second tour took them to London, where they stayed for many months, uh, and that's where Wolfgang met Johann Christian Bach, one of Johann Sebastian Bach's sons, and that's how we hear the beginnings of Mozart's style, very much like Johann Christian Bach's uh, style. Wolfgang and his father uh, took three tours to Italy. Their first tour was in December of 1769, when Wolfgang was 13 years old. And that was a famous tour, uh, because uh, during that tour, they stopped in a number of cities, including Rome, during Easter week. And that was Easter week of April 1770. On Spy Wednesday of, April, of Easter week, uh, Wolfgang and his father were in the Vatican, in St. Peter's, uh, uh, in St. Peter's Cathedral, listening to a, a choir uh, perform. And one of the pieces that the choir performed was a very famous work called the Gregorio Allegri Miserere. It's for two choirs and nine-part polyphony. And the story goes that the Pope was so protective of this piece of music that it was, uh, it was uh, illegal to have copies of it outside of the Vatican. Uh, actually, there were several copies in Europe. There was a copy in Bologna with Padre Martini, who became one of Mozart's teachers, uh, and the King of Portugal had a copy. But Mozart had never seen this, theoretically, and um, when he heard it the first time on Spy Wednesday, he copied it out on a piece of composition paper with very few mistakes returned with his father two days later on Holy Friday uh, to hear it again to make corrections. The Pope, Pope Clement XIV, not only was not going to excommunicate Wolfgang, the Mozarts were uh, Catholic, he actually gave Wolfgang an award, a very important award, a very famous award, the Order of the Golden Spur, Lo Sperone d'Oro in Italian, uh, on July the 4th, 1770. So Wolfgang got actually rewarded for his remarkable feat of uh, perfect pitch and eidetic memory to actually write out the composition, having never seen the score before. So uh, there was a painting made at that time of Mozart with the golden spur. You can see that here on the left. That star-like thing is the actual golden spur, first degree actually, which is the highest uh, award degree of this golden spur. Uh, not even Gluck received the first degree honor. He got a second degree honor. It was a couple of hundred years earlier when Orlando Lasso was, um, was given the first degree of the Golden Spur. Unfortunately, the original oil of 1770 is lost, so this is the copy. And Leopold, Wolfgang's father, said that actually this is a very good likeness of his son. His son was sick that day, uh, but this is actually a very good likeness of Wolfgang. 
Their second tour of Italy uh, took place a year later, and they took a third tour at the end of uh, 1772 into 1773. During that third tour, Mozart wrote one of his first major works, the Exultate Jubilate, the famous motet. And here we're going to hear it. It was originally written for the castrato Venanzio Rauzzini. We're going to hear it here by the great Italian mezzo-soprano Cecilia Bartoli with Riccardo Muti conducting the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. And this was done in Salzburg on Mozart's birthday in 2006, the um, 250th anniversary of Mozart's birth. It was a very famous concert that day. And here is one of the pieces, the Exultate Jubilate. This is the Alleluia, the last movement of that wonderful piece. portraits, and most of the portraits that you see out there are not really him. Only about 10 or 11 were uh, painted during his lifetime and are uh, attested as being authentic. Michael Kelly, the tenor that sang uh, in uh, Marriage of Figaro, said that Mozart was a remarkably small man, very thin and pale, with a profusion of fine, fair hair, of which he was rather vain. Uh, Nemechek, one of his first biographers in the, eight, in the uh, late 1790s, after Mozart died, said about Mozart that there was nothing special about his physique. He was small, and his countenance, except for his large, intense eyes, gave no signs of his genius. Michael Kelly again remembers uh, an event when, at uh, the first rehearsal of the full band, that's of the Ma Marriage of Figaro, Mozart was on the stage with his crimson pelisse and his gold-banded cocked hat, giving the time of the music to the orchestra, meaning beating the time as a conductor would. I shall never forget the little animated countenance when lighted up with the glowing rays of genius. It is as if it is as impossible to describe as it would be to paint sunbeams. Mozart was a uh, prodigy on the uh, harpsichord and forte piano. Here we see a wonderful uh, painting, uh, one of the first that's truly authentic. This is the Verona portrait, which actually uh, was sold by the estate of Alfred Cortot, the famous French pianist, uh, in Paris in uh, December of last year. Uh, it went for $4.4 .4 million. Uh, so this is one of the famous true portraits of the young Mozart. He was 14 years of age when this painting was painted either by Saverio Dalla Rosa or his relative John Bettino Cignaroli or both of them together. One of the other famous paintings, and this is a painting where both Mozart's sister Nanero and Mozart's wife Constanza said that it's a very good likeness of Wolfgang, is the family portrait of 1781 painted by uh, Johann Nepomuk Della Croce. 
And here you see up close the image of Wolfgang uh, in that painting, which is considered to be a true likeness of the composer. And here a 1789 uh, profile view of the composer by Doris Stock, also considered by the family and by Constanza uh, and the, his, his wife to be a very good likeness of the composer. What are those K numbers that you see next to Mozart's works? Those are called Kirkel numbers and they derive from uh, Ludwig Kirkel who was a botanist and mineralogist and also a musicologist and he took on the task of trying to put a chronology, a date, uh, and a number to all the works that were then known to be by Mozart. He came up with 626 works which we know of in the Kirkel catalog. Now we know today, because there have been several revisions of the catalog, we're actually in the sixth edition, uh, and with seven, eight, and nine being sort of versions of the sixth edition, and the tenth edition hasn't come out yet. It's being worked on by Professor Neil Zaslaw of Cornell University leading the team. Uh, it's a monumental task because over the last 250 years, we've learned a bit about which of these pieces truly are his. Uh, several dozen are not or are duplicates or are just torsos and we're not really sure. Uh, and there are also a couple of hundred works in the Kirkel appendix, which in German is the Kirkel Anhang. Uh, so if you add everything together, uh, the 626 works minus, let's even say, a hundred works not being by Mozart, but adding a bit from the appendix, we're looking at well over 500 pieces of music written by Mozart between the age of five and the age of 35 and 11 months when he passed away. So in that 30 year time frame, he wrote over 500 works, almost one work every two weeks, to the point that you could actually figure out Mozart's age by taking the Kirkel number, dividing it by 25, and adding 10. And you would get more or less Mozart's age when he began, uh, when, he, uh, with that, when he wrote that piece of music. Let's listen to the fifth violin concerto, a, frac a, a portion of it. Uh, Mozart wrote the violin concertos, we think, around 1773 to 1775, so he was not quite 20 years old when he wrote it. So let's listen to uh, a 15-year-old playing uh, the beginning of the Mozart fifth violin concerto, which we'll be hearing on the March 1st concert uh, in the first half of the program, which will uh, also include the Mozart Requiem in the second half. So this is Lucilla Rose Mariotti, a 15-year-old violinist, playing the beginning of the Mozart Violin Concerto No. 5 in D major, the Turkish. Franz Joseph Haydn was probably more famous than Mozart, certainly more famous than Mozart during the time Mozart was alive. And actually Haydn was one of the few people that recognized Mozart's genius during Mozart's lifetime. Uh, there was a famous moment in 1785 when Wolfgang was playing viola in a string quartet in a chamber concert at a home in Vienna. 
and Franz Josef Haydn was there and was talking to uh, Leopold, uh, Wolfgang's father, about Wolfgang. And he said, before God, and as an honest man, I tell you that your son Wolfgang is the greatest composer known to me in person or by name. Wolfgang had written six glorious string quartets dedicated to his older friend Franz Josef Haydn, and Haydn was commenting to Leopold about Wolfgang's genius. In fact, Wolfgang played viola in a string quartet which include, uh, included Von Hall uh, as first violinist, and uh, Josef Haydn as second violinist, Mozart as violist, and Karl Ditters von Dittersdorf uh, as the cellist. I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall listening to that string quartet play. When Haydn heard of Mozart's death in December of 1791, he said that posterity shall not see another such as him for 100 years. And indeed, it's been more than 100 years uh, since we've heard of Mozart. Of course, the 19th century gave us Beethoven and Brahms and Mendelssohn and Schubert and Schumann and Gustav Mahler. So we did have remarkable composers, genius composers, in the 19th century. But Haydn's, Haydn's quote really bears weight because of the remarkable genius of Wolfgang. I want to give you an example of that, one of those string quartets that Mozart dedicated to Haydn. And this is the G major string quartet, the first of the six that Wolfgang dedicated to Haydn. It's got a nickname, Frühling, which means spring in German. And it's the Kirkel 387, if we want to look at the catalog number. And here it's played by the Hagen Quartet in the Mozarteum, which is the wonderful resource uh, institution in Salzburg uh, with all things Mozart. Here's the Hagen Quartet playing the opening, uh, I'm sorry, playing the last movement of the uh, Spring Quartet of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, dedicated to Haydn. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, dedicated to Haydn. Many of you have seen uh, the play, or the movie, or both, uh, entitled Amadeus. The play in 1979 in the West End of London, and then on Broadway, and then the movie in 1984, which won eight Academy Awards, including F. Murray Abraham, who won the uh, award for Best Actor for his portrayal of Antonio Salieri in the movie. There's a very famous scene in the movie, the Grand Partita scene. The Grand Partita is a wind serenade. Uh, Kirk Overt Seichnis 361, the E-flat major serenade. And here's a, here's a beautiful fictional moment. The, the, the movie was a historical fiction, a fantasy, but based on a lot of facts. In fact, uh, Peter Schaffer and Milos Forman uh, said uh, very cleverly that um, every scene in, Am in Amadeus has a kernel of truth in it. Of course, many people say, well, it wasn't the truth, it was not a documentary, it wasn't Mozart's uh, factual life. That's true. Uh, but I love both the play and the movie for no other reason than that it gave Mozart's music, it brought Mozart's music to millions of people around the world. So let's watch a bit of the Grand Partita scene when uh, Salieri, who in the movie is Mozart's nemesis, uh, first hears this incredible uh, piece of music. And we're seeing a flashback. Here's Salieri in an insane asylum at the end of his life, flash in, in a flashback back to this moment uh, in, in Vienna. On the page, it looked nothing. The beginning is simple, almost comic. Just a pulse, 
a soon's basset horns, like a rusty squeeze box. <laughs> and then, suddenly, high above it, an elbow. A single note hanging there, unwavering. Until a clarinet took it over. Sweetened it into a phrase of such delight. This was no composition by a performing monkey. This was a music I'd never heard. Filled with such longing, such unfulfillable longing. It seemed to me that I was hearing the voice of God. Hear me. But why? Why would God choose an obscene child to be his instrument? It was not to be believed. The true story is uh, that Salieri and, Mo and Mozart were not really uh, nemesis to each other, although Mozart felt for many months, many years, when he was in Vienna, that the Italians uh, had a cabal, a coterie, uh, and were conspiring against him. But when you think about it, Salieri was already ensconced as the court composer in Vienna uh, by the time Mozart got to Vienna in 1781, and, it wasn't, and Salieri really wasn't uh, worried about uh, Wolfgang Mozart. There were also other composers in Vienna who were quite uh, popular, even more popular than Mozart, composing operas at the time. For example, Martin Soler, uh, whose uh, opera Una Cosa Rara was actually even more popular than Mozart's uh, Marriage of Figaro at the time. Uh, th what happened was that Mozart, although he had visited Vienna before, uh, was still in Salzburg and was chafing there under the rule of the, Arch uh, of the Archbishop Colorado who at one point in the summer of 1781 literally and figuratively had Mozart booted out of the city of Salzburg. And so, and so Mozart moved to Vienna uh, and he had already met Constanze Weber. Uh, he actually initially fell in love with Constanze's older sister Aloysia. They were both fine singers. All four Weber daughters were fine singers. Uh, Aloysia, Aloysia spurned Wolfgang, ended up marrying uh, Josef Lange who painted one of the famous portraits of uh, Wolfgang, interestingly enough. Uh, Mozart ended up marrying Constanze against uh, Wolfgang's father's uh, 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 decision. He didn't, Wolfgang's father did not want Wolfgang to get married because uh, Leopold thought that it would detract from Wolfgang's focus on writing all of his genius compositions. Uh, Mozart made a living at the beginning of his time in Vienna as a piano teacher, a piano tutor, a composer, of course, uh, and he, was, he gave what we call Akademie concerts. Beethoven did this as well. These are subscription concerts where the composer is also the performer, uh, rents the hall, sells the tickets, and keeps the gate receipts after paying the rent. And that's how Mozart made a living, uh, and also by having some of his works published uh, and in those days, interestingly, before the music copyright laws were uh, uh, engraved and enforced, uh, it was difficult to make a lot of money from the printed scores. Uh, but those were the four ways that Mozart made a living in his Vienna years. The, um, one of the things that Mozart wrote shortly after going to Vienna was the C minor mass, the Grossa Messa, which, like the Requiem, uh, is an unfinished work. It's not, it's not finished, but we know that this is all by Mozart himself. It was written uh, in 1782 and only had one performance, actually, in 1783, and that was back in Salzburg, uh, where Constanze accompanied Wolfgang and probably was one of the sopranos. She's probably sang the Laudamus Te, the first soprano solo in the work, uh, after the Kyrie. And Aloysia, the older sister, sang the, the slightly higher tessitura uh, et, et incarnatus est in the middle second half of the work. That was the only time it was performed during Mozart's lifetime. And we don't really know why it was written. We think it wasn't written, it seems, as a commission. It was probably written either to pay back Wolfgang's father, who didn't come to the wedding in Vienna and was angry at Wolfgang for getting married, 
or possibly to honor, for, Mozart, for Wolfgang to honor his marriage uh, to Constanza, or possibly to honor Constanza's recovery from a difficult pregnancy uh, of Raimund Leopold, who unfortunately uh, was one of the six uh, children that died in infancy uh, of the Mozart, uh, of, of Wolfgang and Constanza. They had two boys that did survive to adulthood, Karl Thomas and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart Jr., who was Franz Zauber Mozart, who became quite a fine pianist uh, and composer in his own right. And interestingly, he took piano lessons from Salieri, uh, another, another fact that makes us uh, realize that Mozart and Salieri were probably not mortal enemies. Constanza would never have had her son have music lessons with one of Mozart's mortal en en enemies. So there you have another fact uh, against the, the story about Salieri and Mozart being uh, uh, enemies of one another. So, like the Requiem, the C minor Mass is a torso, an incomplete work, but it's a, an incredibly beautiful, glorious work, every, every bit as beautiful and sublime as the Requiem. Uh, I'm going to have you hear uh, one of the great moments of the Requiem, which is the Et Incarnatus S. This is the second of the great soprano solos in the work. Uh, here we're going to hear the great Swedish soprano Mia Persson singing the uh, Et Incarnatus Est. Uh, and this is John Elliott Gardner conducting the Royal Stockholm Philharmonic and the Monteverdi Choir uh, at the Nobel Prize ceremonies in Stockholm in 2008. How wonderful that geniuses are being uh, awarded the Nobel Prizes and are being given this wonderful music festival where the genius Mozart's music is played. Et Incarnatus Est from the C minor mass. I alluded earlier to opera in Vienna in the 1780s. 
Opera was a wonderful art form, a very popular art form at a time before television and radio and CDs and music streaming. This was what people did at night. They wanted entertainment and they wanted elegant entertainment. And Mozart was actually quite fortunate to meet up with a librettist uh, and the two of them together, Wolfgang Mozart and the librettist Lorenzo da Ponte, who was born Emanuele Cornigliano, and his name then changed to Lorenzo da Ponte because he was an orphan, and they named him after the, uh, the church father who took him, who took him over. Um, he was born in a Jewish family, and then the father converted to Catholicism. And he ended up being an orphan, and he was adopted and got the name of the, of the, uh, of the bishop or the, the, the priest and that became Lorenzo da Ponte. An interesting fellow who not only was a brilliant librettist and lyricist, but ended up coming to the United States in the 1800s and to New York City and became the first professor of Italian language and literature at Columbia University. But back in the 1780s, Mozart and da Ponte collaborated on three of the greatest operas in the whole repertoire of opera. Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, Don Juan, and Così fan tutte, which means all women are like that. Let's listen to one of the glorious moments in the marriage of Figaro. Here's a moment when Susanna and the Countess are crafting a letter to try to trick the Count uh, into one of his uh, philandering moments. So here we have Gundolo Janowitz, the great German soprano, and Edith Matis, uh, another great uh, soprano, singing the uh, Sularia, Che soave Zefiretto. What a wonderfully soft breeze. As I mentioned, Mozart, the Mozarts had two sons, Karl Thomas and Franz Zaver. And Franz Zaver, who was the boy on the left, the younger of the two, uh, had a, uh, an anomalous external ear, a funny external ear. Uh, and that's an important point when we come to uh, Mozart's uh, physical uh, traits and Mozart's health and illness, which we'll get to in a moment. I've talked a bit about opera, which of course is a big part of Mozart's uh, great legacy. His operas were 
remarkable achievements. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the three De Ponte co collaborations are among the greatest of all operas ever written. But here's another moment in one of a Mozart a opera, one that's not quite as well known. This is La Clemenza di Tito, the last one he wrote, the second to last to be produced uh, after um, the, the, uh, the Magic Flute. And here's a moment when two minor characters get together for a two-minute duet. And it's just a brief moment, a frisson, in, in this three-and-a-half-hour opera. But it's a moment of great beauty. This is A Perdona, a Primo Affetto. You'll hear uh, Anne, Anne Howells as Anio, that's the trouser role, so she's singing a male character, and Catherine Malfitano as Servilia, Metropolitan Opera under James Levine. Mozart, as I mentioned, was born in a Catholic family. Uh, although he didn't practice uh, the faith, he certainly was Catholic. But he was also a Mason at a time in history when one could be both. Uh, at that time, in the 1780s, Joseph II took over the rule of the Habsburg Empire after the death of his mother, Maria Theresa. She was against Masonry. Joseph II himself was a Mason, and although the, although the, the Catholic Church in Rome, the Vatican, uh, was against Masonry and did not want any of the lodges to be, uh, to, 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 uh, to be in existence, uh, in Vienna those restrictions were not enforced, and a number of lodges uh, were quite uh, well attended by the, by the great minds of, of the city at the time. Uh, masonry, as you probably know, is a, 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 a philosophical movement that, that brings together Egyptian, 
uh, themes and Eleusinian rituals. Uh, and that brief decade of tolerance in the 1780s was when Mozart uh, joined a Masonic lodge. Uh, it, the, the Masons have a, a belief system that has something to do with the Enlightenment and Rousseau's concepts of the uh, sauvage noble and noblesse oblige and egalité, liberté and fraternité. Uh, and there is sort of a loose relationship to the Illuminati and that rationalist philosophy uh, with with the Masons, although they are different, uh, they are different groups. Mozart was inducted into the Beneficence Masonic Lodge, uh, Zur Voltategeit, in December of 1784, uh, and that was then uh, consolidated into a, another lodge, the one called uh, A New Crowned Hope. Uh, for the Masons, uh, Mozart wrote a number of wonderful uh, pieces for Mas of Masonic uh, funeral music, the Mauritia Traumersik, and uh, of course, the, the Magic Flute has a lot of Masonic themes and allegory in the number three, the, the key of E flat major, which is three flats, the three pairs of protagonists with Tamino and Pamina, Papageno and Papagena, and the Queen of the Night and Sarastro. But there's a lot of numerical or numerology in the Magic Flute that may have some relationship to Masonry. All brothers, dukes, the poor, and even musicians were equal in the Masonic uh, philosophy. As I mentioned, em uh, the Emperor was, the Emperor Joseph II was himself a Mason, as was Franz Josef Haydn, Mozart's father Leopold, uh, and Emmanuel Schikaneder, who was the librettist for the Magic Flute. Here we see a beautiful uh, scene uh, from uh, the Magic Flute. This was from an 1816 production uh, in uh, Berlin. And you can see there the Queen of the Night on a crescent moon, and all these uh, th uh, groups of three stars uh, in the firmament in the dark, uh, the dark sky. In the summer of 1791, Mozart was uh, introduced to, uh, uh, theoretically, uh, a knock on the door by a mysterious stranger called the Gray Messenger. And this messenger was an agent uh, of someone who wanted Mozart to uh, compose a Requiem Mass. Uh, Mozart was interested in death. He talked about death. Uh, he said to his uh, wife um, uh, in a letter, I'm sorry, he said to his sister in a letter that he wrote, uh, that death is the true goal of our existence. I have formed close relations with this truest friend of mankind, that his image is no longer terrifying to me, but truly consoling. Death is the key which unlocks the door of our true happiness. I never lie down at night and not think as young as I am that I may not live to see another day. And so Mozart saw the Requiem that he was writing as his own funeral music. We know that the truth, that we, uh, that's not what we see in the movie Amadeus or in the play where we are led to believe that Salieri commissioned the Requiem. That's not true. The Requiem was actually commissioned by a wealthy gentleman by the name of Stupak, uh, the Count Franz Walseg von Stupak, Zuzu Stupak. He was a gypsum mine owner in the town of Stupak, which was 45 miles or so uh, from Vienna. And he wanted to commission the Requiem, although Mozart did not know any of this, uh, to honor his deceased wife, that is Stupak's deceased wife, who died at the age of 20 of puerperal se uh, sepsis, se sepsis, uh, which is an infection surrounding ch uh, childbirth, puerperal se sepsis. And, and Stupak wanted to pass this requiem off as his own work. He would, he would commission composers for lots of things and then make believe that he himself had written them. So Mozart began composing the requiem. He was in August of 1791. He was given half the, the commission at that time. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't finish very much of it. He started writing it, but then he took some time to write Clemenza di Tito and the Magic Flute and the Clarinet Concerto and some other pieces of music, the Ave Verum Corpus for his friend Anton Stoll. Uh, and uh, as Mozart was dying, he was still working on the Requiem. Uh, he was working with his assistant Franz Zaber Sussmeier uh, at the time of his death. And at the time of his death, only the beginning uh, movement, the introitus, which is the Requiem Aeternam and the Kyrie, did he actually complete with orchestral parts. Uh, in fact, the Kyrie itself only has what we call particella writing, which means not complete writing, but the melody is there, some of the underlying bass notes, but a lot of the middle voices uh, were not yet filled in. For the Dies Irae, all the way through the Tuba Mirum, the Rex Tremendi, 
uh, the Recordare, the Confutatis, the Lacrimosa, and the, uh, uh, there was really not much written there by Mozart. Uh, and in fact, the second half of the Requiem, if you will, uh, the Sanctus, the Benedictus, and the Agnus Dei, Wolfgang did not put pen to paper for any of those movements. But he gave, we think he gave, Schussmeier instruction as to how to finish the Requiem. And the Requiem that we're going to hear this afternoon by Maestro Bialand and the Waterbury Symphony in the Hartford Chorale is the Sussmeyer completion of the Mozart Requiem with a couple of uh, emendations by a, mus a musicologist composer uh, named uh, Bayer in the early 1900s. Here we see one of the things about the Requiem that's so fascinating. We see Mozart's handwriting at the beginning here and at the back here, this is Sussmeyer's handwriting. Sussmeyer happened to have the ability to write musical notes and words and actual uh, musical tempo markings in a handwriting that was virtually indistinguishable from Mozart's. Now, musicologists can tell them apart, but Stupak, who commissioned the Requiem, could not. Uh, we do know that, for example, this is uh, Sussmeyer faking Mozart's signature, and notice these three numbers, 792. In those days, if you thought you were going to finish something in the future year, you would put the future year out there. So this did not uh, disturb Stupak in the least. Stupak knew that Mozart had died in December of 1791. That piece of news got to his town in 1791. But we can see Mozart's handwriting, the M begins at the top, and in, 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 that's Mozart's own handwriting at the bottom. Here in Sussmeyer, he begins the M at the bottom. So there's ways of telling uh, that. And again, that 792 stands for 1792. Mozart didn't live to see the year 1792. But Sussmeyer was able to forge the handwriting, finish the Requiem, give it to Constanza, who then gave it to uh, Stupak, received the second half of the payment. Uh, Constanza cleverly had several other copies made, which she ended up selling to various uh, princes, as well as to the publishing company Breitkopf and Hertel. So she made quite a bit of money on the Requiem. Let's listen to a, a moment of, in, the, in this glorious piece of music. This is the Lacrimosa. We'll hear the beginning of this very tender and poignant movement in the Mozart Requiem. And again, these are Mozart's notes. I mentioned Amadeus earlier, and I wanted to uh, take a few moments to show another scene in the movie, uh, a scene that I think really does a very good job of demonstrating the creative process. Again, that was a historical fantasy, not a documentary, but as I said earlier, Schaefer and Foreman, the director and, and producer of the movie, knew a lot about Mozart, and there's a kernel of truth in that, in that scene. Uh, we have, uh, in the movie, we have the F. Murray Abraham character of Salieri being so in awe of uh, Mozart's 
genius talent and so jealous of it that Salieri says in the movie, Mozart had simply written down music already finished in his head, page after page of it, as if he were just taking dictation from God. As a matter of fact, Mozart, like Beethoven after him and like Brahms after Beethoven, uh, did a lot of creating by walking around. It's interesting that if you walk around and, and, and are thinking and not just sitting at a desk or sitting by your laptop or your iPhone, ideas come into your head. And like Beethoven and Brahms after him, Mozart had a little notebook. He would do a lot of walks in, in, in Vienna in the Prater Gardens, in the Prater Gardens, for example, and he would jot down motifs and melodies that just came into his head. And we would go back to these motifs and melodies later on, maybe that evening or a couple of days later, and flesh them out into pieces of music, some of which really never became full pieces of music. And we have a lot of these so-called insipits or torsos in the Kirkel Anhang, in the appendix of the Kirkel catalog. Uh, in terms of writing music, Mozart didn't, it didn't just come to him as if he was the amanuensis, the secretary of God. Mozart worked on it, worked hard on it. He would write out the melodic line and then the bass line first, and then even he would have some trouble going back in and filling in those middle voices, those violas and bassoons and French horns and those lower voices that may not be the melody but support the melody. Many of the autograph manuscripts of Mozart seem perfect, but actually there are some corrections and there are some emendations. And we know this from the superb work of the uh, late uh, and sadly uh, uh, gone Alan Tyson, uh, who has written a wonderful book on Mozart autographs and composition paper. By studying the composition paper and autographs, uh, Tyson was able to re-categorize a lot of the pieces of music as to the chronology. And that's why in the 6th edition, and hopefully now in the 10th edition of the Kirkwood Catalog, whenever that comes out, there will be a more accurate uh, numbering system for the actual uh, time when these pieces were written. So let's look at uh, the creative process uh, in the Requiem, as I've talked about. Let's watch this scene, the Confutatis scene in Amadeus. Amadeus. All right. Yes, yes, he was continued. Second beat of the fourth measure, on F. Now the orchestra. Second bassoon and bass trombones with the basses. Identical notes and rhythm. First bassoon, tenor trombones with the tenors. Not too fast. Do you have it? Not too fast. Do you have it? First bassoon, tenor trombone, what? With the tenors. Identical? Of course. The instruments doubling the voices. Now, trumpets and timpani, trumpets and D. No. Listen to no, me. I don't understand. Listen. It goes with the harmony. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I understand. Yes, yes. And that's all. No, no, not with a real fire. Strings in unison. Ostinato on A, like this. X measures rising. Yes, 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 I think so. C major, sopranos and altos and thirds, altos on C, sopranos above. I'm going to conclude uh, my talk with a bit of uh, discussion of Mozart's health, his illnesses, his death, and his legacy. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Mozart's early childhood tours around Europe exposed him and his sister to a lot of, of microbial illnesses. Uh, they, do, they both uh, succumbed to smallpox. Uh, Mozart had repeated episodes of rheumatic fever, which is usually due to streptococcal infection. Uh, he had typhus, a different type of microbe. 
Uh, he had a tonsillar abscess from Quincy. Later on, possibly had heart issues. We know that he was medicating himself with antimony, or antimony, which is a, a, um, a, 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 an element, a, a, heavy, a heavy element, a heavy metal element, uh, which can be poisonous. And we think that because of those recurrent strep infections, he may have developed chronic kidney disease, chronic renal disease, what we call uh, glomerulonephritis. Some uh, scholars think that Mozart was uh, cyclothymic, that he had moments of mania and moments of depression. Uh, he might have had a, an autoimmune condition called the Hinox schonlein purpura. He fell on his left side of his head quite severely in 1790, and he may have had a subdural hematoma. I mentioned the fact that his second son, uh, Franz Zauver Mozart, who's known as Wolfgang Mozart Jr., had a funny external ear, and we think that Mozart himself had an external ear that was anomalous. Here on the left, you see uh, Mozart's left ear, and on the right, you see Mo uh, a, a normal ear. And because of that, uh, we, we assume that uh, Franz Zauver was indeed the, the child of Wolfgang, and Constanza, because there was a bad scurrilous rumor going around that Constanza, who was frequently ill and going to the baths uh, at Baden by Wien, uh, was accompanied there often by Sussmeier, the very Sussmeier, Franz Zauber Sussmeier, same first names as the second son, Franz Zauber Sussmeier, who would accompany her to Baden by Wien. But I think the external ear anomaly that we think is, uh, was present in both Wolfgang himself and the son makes the, uh, the second son the, the issue of Wolfgang and Constanza. Uh, uh, I want to say that even though there might have been an external ear abnormality in Wolfgang, certainly his inner ear, his perfect pitch, his eidetic pitch, his absolute pitch, uh, was, was absolutely perfectly normal. So we have to go from those chronic illnesses to what we call in medicine the proximate cause of death. What killed Mozart? Was it Salieri? No, that was just the, the movie, and that was just a, a crazy rumor uh, that Salieri heard about and actually might have mentioned when he went crazy at the end of his life in the 1820s uh, in the insane asylum in Vienna. But he actually confessed to Ignaz Moscheles, who was Mendelssohn's teacher, that the rumor that Salieri had anything to do with Mozart's demise was absolutely false. Uh, did the Masons or the Illuminati conspire him? Why would they do that? They adored Mozart. They revered him. There was a story about Hofdamel and a jealous, the wife, the jealous, the jealous husband, Hofdamer, that might have shot Mozart. There's no evidence for that. There was no evidence that, Mer that Mozart ever took mercury, so therefore we don't think he had syphilis. He was actually very scared of, of ever frequenting uh, a prostitute. Uh, and so even if he had some relationships with women, they might have been some of the singers in his operas, uh, there's no evidence for, for that, for syphilis. I mentioned earlier that the, uh, he might have over-medicated himself with antimony or antimony. There's also a theory that he ate undercooked pork, uh, which we know that he did because there's a letter that he wrote to his wife when she was sick again in Baden by Wien, and he's back in Vienna, and he writes to his wife, what do I smell? Pork cutlets, que gusto, what a delicious taste. I eat to your health. Uh, he might have had acute trichinosis. The disease itself wasn't defined until the early 1800s, but there's that theory. But the best guess is that Mozart had chronic kidney disease. He had recurrent streptococcal disease and therefore rheumatic fever, may have had heart issues. And there was a known to be an epidemic of a microbial infection uh, in Vienna in December of 1791. Uh, we get that information from a very well done analysis of thousands of death certificates done by Professor Richard Zagers, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2009. And it's possible that Mozart basically died of the consequences of a pneumonia from the strep infection, kidney disease from the recurrent strep infections, anemia because of, of the kidney problems that he probably had. And interestingly, what his physicians did at the end of his life was they didn't have very much to offer, so they bloodlet him of a couple of pints of blood. He was already anemic, and so that probably did him in, gave him uh, a shock, and he died. Uh, the, there was no autopsy done, but the death certificate says uh, una deposita sulla testa, which means a deposit on the head, which could have been a rheumatoid nodule. 
the word Wassersucht, which means severe edema, basically water in all of the tissues. And then this very nonspecific term, uh, ein hitziges Frieselfieber, fever, which means uh, a severe miliary fever, kind of small dots uh, on the skin, which is nonspecific, so we can't determine what that all means. Uh, there was a death mask which was broken clumsily, as Constanza herself said, in the 1820s. Uh, this was a death mask that was, uh, quote, found, unquote, in 1947, made out of bronze. I don't believe it really represents the composer. Uh, why would it have been found uh, 150 years after his death in an attic in Vienna when people were looking for Mozart relics for uh, every day for 150 years? But there is this curious... Uh, osseous remain. This is a calvarium, which is a cranium, meaning it's a skull that's missing the mandible. And it's in the Mozarteum, which is the, the Salzburg Institution. It may or may not be Mozart. We're not sure. Interestingly, it does have a fracture in the left uh, temporal parietal area on, this, on that part of the head of the, of, the, of the calvarium, which is precisely where Mozart fell in 1790. So is, are we looking at the skull of Mozart? I don't know, but that's what some people think. If we superimpose that skull on the Doris Stock profile, things do uh, fit together awfully uh, well, interestingly enough. And here is a, a forensic uh, re, uh, reconstitution of what his face might have looked like, and that looks pretty similar there to the Doris Stock silver point. What is the enduring legacy of Mozart? As I mentioned, when he was alive, not many people recognized his genius. His great operas, The Marriage of Figaro, John Giovanni, and Così fan tutte, they had, certainly they had performances. The city of Prague adored him, perhaps even more than Vienna did. But it was only after his death, in fact, The Magic Flute was probably his most popular opera, but he died at the end of 1791, a few months after the premiere of, of, of The Magic Flute in September of that year. But then people started realizing what a genius he was, and we now have a legacy uh, of the composer. Was Mozart an evolutionary composer? That is, did he take Viennese classical style and bring it to its apotheosis? Or was he, like Beethoven, a revolutionary composer? That is, did he actually break into Romanticism with the Requiem and Don Giovanni and the fantasies that are in the minor keys, the D minor and C minor fantasies, and the C minor mass? Uh, a lot of those, and the D minor and C minor piano concertos, the 20th and 24th, uh, a lot of those pieces have a romantic uh, chromaticism that breaks uh, out of the sonata form and Viennese classical style. So we can argue either way. Uh, the brilliant Charles Rosen wrote a book that is fundamental in trying to understand the evolutionary versus the revolutionary, a book called The Classical Style, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. This book won the 1972 National Book Award and discusses the evolution and revolution of sonata form in these three great geniuses. It's a difficult read, but it's one that's very much worth your while, better to understand these concepts. But it's interesting that we seem to mythologize genius, that is, we create a mythology around Shakespeare and Leonardo da Vinci and Mozart and Beethoven and Albert Einstein in our own last century. Why do we mythologize genius? Why do we create a hagiography, a saint-like portrait? For example, here's the Vienna Monument uh, to Mozart. He looks more like a young Beethoven or Goethe, this sort of Adonis face. He doesn't, have, he doesn't look anything like that prosaic, normal, a looking face of Mozart that we saw in the authenticated portraits. Why do we, why do, we do this? And I, and I think it's because we want geniuses. We want mythology. We want fantasy. We want our, our great geniuses to be, to be like gods, actually. Uh, to the point that many of the quotes that are ascribed to Mozart were actually not written by Mozart. Or here's one that people recognize. Music, even in situations of the greatest horror, should never be painful to the ear, but should flatter and charm, and therefore always remain music. It sounds like Mozart, but actually it wasn't written by Mozart. It was written in the 1800s by a guy named Rocklitz, who wrote a forged letter, making believe that it was written by Mozart. Here's another one that's very popular in, in the, uh, in, on the internet. Uh, most, neither a lofty degree of intelligence nor imagination, nor both together, go to the making of genius. Love, love, love. That is the soul of genius. 
Mozart didn't say that either. But it sounds like something that Mozart could have said. I want to end with uh, a brief discussion of the Mozart effect. Many of you have heard about the Mozart effect, uh, that if you play Mozart to your child or grandchild, uh, they're going to grow up to be geniuses and get into Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Oxford or Cambridge. There is something to the Mozart effect. It began very simply uh, by a test of spatial uh, recognition. Uh, in a paper unfolding test in 1988 by uh, a professor, uh, Francis Rauscher, uh, Gordon Shaw, and Key. Uh, they were at that time professors uh, in uh, the University of California, Irvine, in the Department of Psychology, and they looked at um, treating a group of students, the same group of students, three different ways, with 10 minutes of Mozart's D major, two piano sonata, Kirkle 448, the whole first movement, which is seven minutes, and a few minutes of the second movement. Relaxation music by Philip Glass, or silence. And after these three pretreatments, each time, the group was given a paper unfolding spatial recognition test. And interestingly, the, when that group of students was, quote, pretreated, unquote, with the Mozart music, for 15 or 20 minutes, they did better on this spatial recognition test. I've written a detailed analysis of the Mozart effect which was published uh, a few years back in the International Journal of Medical Humanities and the reference is at the bottom of this slide if any of you are interested in, in reading it. Uh, but interestingly from that uh, Mozart effect, and they didn't even call it that in the 1988 article by Nature, uh, a gentleman by the name of Douglas Campbell wrote a book called The Mozart Effect and how that can stimulate uh, intelligence. And there's been a lot of talk about the Mozart effect, but one thing that is true, and we know this from neurological studies that have been done subsequent to that original paper, after the paper was contested and it was found to be not reproducible, what is reproducible is that Mozart's music, and interestingly the music of Johann Christian Bach, that very composer who was one of Mozart's first teachers back in 1765 when they were in London, Mozart, his sister, and his father, and the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Those three composers, Mozart, Wolfgang Mozart, Johann Christian Bach, and Johann Sebastian Bach. The, the repetitions and the repeats and the periodicity of their music seem to align with our theta waves in our brain. And this has been looked at by electroencephalography by a group of neurologists at the University of Illinois, of Fino and Hughes, who've published their findings. So there's something about music and I think it can be different types of music that seem to align our neurons and perhaps make us focus and concentrate more. So I personally believe there's a lot there. There is something to the Mozart effect. There's something very powerful about music in our brain and music in our minds, not only uplifting us spiritually and nourishing us, if you will, but also doing wonderful things for us that actually have tangible uh, 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 results in our brains themselves. And so I'm going to end by saying that here we have had an hour and a bit longer of a talk about a great genius, the genius Wolfgang Amadei Mozart, a man who you would probably pass by in the street and not give a second thought to in terms of the way he looked, but a man who gave the world an eternity of the most beautiful music. Thank you very much. If you would like some more information uh, from some of my research and publications, on my blog, A Musical Vision, are about 20 uh, program note essays that I've written uh, and uh, articles on what Mozart looked like, where I review in detail the authenticated portraiture and the false portraiture, many of the false portraits, not all of them. Uh, I wrote a paper about Mozart and Beethoven and their phenomenal connection, although they never met. Beethoven was very much influenced by Mozart and Mozart's music, and we see that in many of Beethoven's compositions. Uh, I wrote a, a lengthy uh, article, which is sort of a, a, an overview of Mozart's life, uh, called Euterpe Deconstructed. Euterpe was the muse of music. Uh, another article in deep, uh, a deeper discussion of the ophthalmology and iconology of Mozart portraiture called Visualizing Mozart and Mozart's effect on us, which is my analysis, my meta-analysis of 25 years of the Mozart effect. Those last three articles were published in the Hectoan International Journal of Medical Humanities. Enjoy these articles, enjoy Mozart's music, and thank you very much.